Okay. Great. Great, so welcome to our June webinar. Today, uh, just briefly about the research effort that we're undergoing uh, as we look at specialty mushroom production um, as a really viable crop for uh, small scale producers uh, in the US. We're specifically targeting geographically our work right now in New York State, New York City, and the Northeast. But a lot of the work we're doing uh, definitely applies across the, uh, across the country. So, Excited to share what we learn as we go. We've been working in this field for quite some time. Uh, through the Small Farms Program, we've been doing mushroom research um, for about 15 years, mostly on outdoor systems, and we're just really starting to dip into uh, controlled climate or indoor production systems. And, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, a bit about the research that we're uh, undergoing with that. Um, I want to just always acknowledge our, our wonderful partners, both organizations, um, and those in the mushroom industry right now. So a lot of spawn suppliers or educators, teachers, um, all sorts of innovation. I think what's really exciting to me and I, what I love about this segment of the world is it's, it's growing and it's, uh, it's a time for exploration uh, and, and for people to uh, carve out different niches and to find their way. And, um, and certainly uh, for a lot of us in agriculture, it's a different crop, it's a new crop, it's an exciting crop. So we appreciate all these folks and their ongoing participation in different aspects. And you'll hear about ways we're specifically plugging in, them into this project as we, as we go along today. Um, and just a little bit about the webinars. They're on the first Wednesday of every month. Um, there is a link on our website, cornellmushrooms.org to register. If you haven't done that, we'd like to have that information. And when you register, you just need to do it once and we'll send you the link each month to log into the webinar. Um, and if you miss it or can't attend, we'll be posting them both to the homepage at cornellmushrooms.org as well as on the Cornell Small Farms YouTube channel. And we'll post two videos for each of our webinars. So we'll carry these through the end of the year and probably continue on and cover a wide range of different topics around the project specific stuff that we're doing and also to hear from other folks lots of different voices in the mushroom uh, world. Uh, next month next month we'll be hearing international stories of mushroom cultivation which we'll, we'll be looking forward to and our website is really our home base you can find out all the information about connecting to these webinars. You can join our grower listserv. You can access any educational resources that we have, uh, videos, fact sheets, principal guides, that sort of thing. We have a list of suppliers. Um, all those sorts of things are available. Cornellmushrooms.org. Mushrooms with an S. So just to be clear at the outset, um, if you were with us last month, but I like to reiterate what we're talking about here is specialty mushrooms. Uh, so that's any mushroom other than Agaricus bisporus, which is the common button, cremini, and portobello mushroom. Those are actually all the same uh, species with slightly different um, subspecies or conditions that they're grown in to achieve the variability that you see between those mushrooms. So we're talking about everything else. And uh, the most popular specialty mushrooms, uh, by the way, the, the word specialty mushrooms is simply something that the USDA um, has named uh, in the industry as something not uh, that is not a button mushroom. Uh, the most common ones are oyster and shiitake. Uh, you can see here shiitake growing on logs and also lion's mane there on the bottom of the screen. Our research and extension project is really uh, twofold. Um, or really, I should say it's multifaceted, but we, we always think about trying to do some research component and some extension component. So we like to ask questions and then research answers to those questions and then do ongoing and also education as a result of what we find out from asking those questions. So within this project, um, some of the things we're doing ongoing is we will have a number of hands-on classes um, in this uh, summer, mostly in New York City. Uh, we have online courses that happen in the off season, meaning in the fall and winter. Um, we are embarking on a training of trainers project that's supported from Northeast SARE, which Yolanda is going to talk about what that looks like. So anyone out there who is educating others about growing, about farming, um, we want to welcome you in and encourage you to consider joining us for the training and support that we're going to be able to offer through that program. And Yolanda will, will get more into that. What I'm going to focus on is this bottom piece, which is uh, some of the research that we've identified uh, with our uh, um, collaborating growers, folks in the industry, what are the kind of questions that we need to answer through the production lens and what kind of research we're going to be doing um, in our program. 
I showed this slide last month. Um, just want to mention there's, uh, for, for new folks, there are indoor and outdoor methods of cultivation. You can see here in terms of species, there's really only one species that's that's economically or commercially viable at scale um, outdoors, and that's shiitake on logs. But once we go indoors, uh, we can really expand that palette of species, which is really why we're getting involved with this work. Um, this uh, visual is uh, available on our website, and um, uh, and you can uh, dig into that a bit more. Uh, it's right on the homepage. So oh, um, what we're talking about with indoor, a lot of folks start out with oysters um, on either straw or sawdust. They're one of the easiest mushrooms to get started with. It's kind of the beginner mushroom uh, to, to get your feet wet. And then folks grow from there and expand into different species depending on their interest, uh, the conditions they can maintain in their growing space, and the markets and what those um, are interested in. Uh, for instance, the chestnut mushroom there in the top right is one that is uh, really getting a lot of chefs excited. So a lot of growers are, are checking that one out as a kind of a new one to focus their production systems on. So um, really when we talk about mushroom cultivation, we're talking about, I could, if I could say it in one sentence, this might be the sentence I would say. So we're feeding the right species of mushroom and, and also the right strain. You can think of a strain sort of like a cultivar or a selection. You know, you think about the different types of tomatoes or apples that are out there. There are different strains of oyster mushroom. There's different strains of shiitake. So we feed that uh, mycelium. Um, we feed it the right foods and we call those in the industry, we call those substrates. So we feed it a substrate, straw, sawdust, uh, cottonseed hulls, soybean hulls, uh, coffee grounds, all sorts of different things, logs, wood chips, that sort of thing. And what we're trying to do is support the mycelium, not the, the mushroom, but the mycelium. That's really the fungal organism itself is called mycelium. And that's mycelium is rapidly growing through that substrate. And at that point in the process, what we're mostly concerned is maintaining a very consistent temperature and protecting that mycelium from contamination from other competitive fungi out in the environment, whether that's outdoors or indoors. And then as growers, what we do is we provide the proper conditions and support for them to fruit and fruit beautifully. Uh, in indoor situations, especially, uh, we're thinking about temperature, humidity, light, and fresh air as some of the main things. Um, outdoors, the woods and the forest provide a lot of those things for us, which is one of the main advantages um, with outdoor production. So when we get to the economics, and this gets into really the research that we're trying to, to chew on and think about, um, what we're looking at is, is some questions around you know, what we know and what we don't know. And um, in contrast, the work we've done with log grown shiitake, we have pretty good figures and understanding of what this looks like. What are the costs of production? What are the potential yields? And what, what does it take to do it in terms of labor? So these are the questions we're really setting out to answer in our three-year research project. When we get into um, uh, indoor spaces, uh, at minimum, most grow operations have two spaces. One is an incubation space and one is a fruiting space. And so one of the challenges is always kind of trying to maintain these environments and figure out how to balance these things out. And you can see from the graphic here, not a ton of difference between these two, but, but really important differences that are there. Um, and, and so uh, this becomes one of the main challenges when we look at growers trying to adapt to lots of different uh, variables in their environment. For instance, the, the outside uh, sun, you know, heat uh, hitting the building that they're growing in and, and that can really affect um, how much heating uh, or cooling they have to add to the system. Um, things like contamination, you know, building out spaces that can be easily cleaned and easily maintained. These all become little variables when we talk about going from, uh, I'm able to grow mushrooms, so I'm able to do this really consistently at a good yield. Um, if we zoom out a little further, there's really a lot of pieces to the process of, of cultivation of fungi. And I, I like to preface this with the idea that, you know, this doesn't mean this is part of the industrial sort of the, the industry of mushroom cultivation. This isn't something that everyone's going to do every single uh, piece of this process. But if we're going to maintain uh, mushrooms and we're going to have them and we're going to cultivate them, what that means is humans are playing the role in stewarding different strains, different species through. So culture libraries are really where this all starts. This is, these are places and people who maintain different strains of mushrooms um, and often are, are doing that so that they can sell those to folks who want to cultivate mushrooms. And so culture, a culture library can be old strains that have been bred for high yielding uh, uh, results. It can be something very unique, something that's been found out in the environment that might grow on a novel species of wood or in some kind of novel condition. But a culture library is a, is a piece of the process that has to be maintained. 
from that culture library, uh, masters are created. This is a sort of first generation uh, growing out of the fungal mycelium. From master uh, uh, sp uh, materials, we, we create spawn. And so spawn is when we start to create material that we're gonna inoculate substrate with. Then we inoculate the substrate itself. And then we, as I mentioned before, as growers in the grower's shoes, often we're stimulating that initial growth and that fruiting. And then we have to sell the mushrooms, right? So this is a whole process. And when folks first get in, they often wanna do all the things. So one thing I like to emphasize is the different ways that people get into growing mushrooms when they're thinking about, oh, I wanna grow and I wanna sell these mushrooms. So all these blocks are different things that we've seen growers do, and they're just different levels and different options. And as we move down this list, we do increase our infrastructure needs. There's a bit of increase in skill as we go. Uh, we do have more control over the parameters of production, and there's often more labor involved because we're taking on more of the steps. Now there's also the potential to increase the, the profit margin in some of these steps if we can do them successfully because we're doing them ourselves versus outsourcing them. And what I like to focus on with this production process is, you know, if you're familiar with a uh, vegetable production or something like that, you know, very few vegetable farms uh, grow really high quality produce and also uh, produce all their own compost for fertility and also save and, and recycle all their own seed. Very often they buy seed from a seed company, uh, or, which is often a cooperative of multiple farms. Very often they might bring in fertility from other places that specialize in high quality compost. So in the same way, we can't necessarily be in charge of, or we can't necessarily wrap our heads around all the pieces of mushroom production. So we might rely on folks in the, in the wider community and the wider industry to provide some of these materials. And you can see on the right side of this, um, as we go down, these are the types of spaces that we have to start to have on farm if we're gonna start to take on more and more of that production process. So the simplest one at the top is if you can create a space that has the parameters for good successful fruiting of mushrooms, well, all you need to do then is buy in blocks that folks have inoculated and have supported through that first initial growth phase. And all you're doing is fruiting the mushrooms and harvesting them and potentially selling them. As we go down the list, then we can purchase spawn from suppliers, and then we can inoculate our own materials and stimulate and support that initial growing process and then fruit them and then sell them. So that's another level up because we need not just a fruiting room, but we need an incubation room. And really when we get into sawdust as the substrate, we need to sterilize and really clean that before we use it. And so we often need a quote unquote lab. We need a space that's really clean to do that work. If we wanna get into, uh, as we move down this list, something like buying a, ma a master and making our own spawn, well then we really need a lab in capital letters. We need something very clean, professional. We also need the skill set to understand how to do that successfully. And then finally, we could be doing all the things. We could produce masters and spawn and inoculate. We could be maintaining a library. And of course, that would require the highest level of skill and information. So what's important here is, is to, if you're a beginner to this, is to start with what's most simple, what's least taxing in terms of infrastructure, and then build your skills over time and understand when you could add more of these layers or less of these layers into your production. So what I love about this industry is folks are really innovative, really creative. They're thinking about lots of different spaces they can convert. This is Fungi Ally, who was growing for a time in converted old refrigerator trucks, as an example, um, both doing some of their own inoculation, producing some of their own spawn, and also sometimes buying in blocks, depending on the situation, the time of year, um, and other circumstances. So, you know, just an example, you can really start to think about and, and uh, consider what's around you as a resource you might be able to turn into some type of productive space. Really common is this, uh, you know, maybe we could use uh, an old shipping container as a space and we could make that work for us. So um, basements, garages, uh, old warehouse spaces, closets, um, uh, all sorts of different places can be repurposed, depending on, again, how much of that growing process you want to be involved with. So what we're working on at the university is uh, to model production and understand some of the different costs associated with it try to offer to folks a blueprint of what it would look like to scale up to commercial production if they wanted to produce 100 or 200 pounds a week. Um, and then try to do the research to understand some of the, the nuances in the production system. So we've been working with some designs. We've been thinking about um, uh, containers. We've been thinking about racks. We've been thinking about uh, and talking to other growers about all these different considerations. 
our proposal, our hypothesis for our research is really going to be that a standard shipping container, which is 40 feet long, um, 8 feet wide, nine, and a half, nine, 9 feet 6 inches tall, that we can sustain 100 pounds of production. We're going to be doing this production research in 2020 and 2021 and hopefully into the future. But our goal is can we see if we can, if we can produce 100 pounds a week and what that looks like. So we're modeling this and we're going to collect this production data. A bunch of different uh, research questions that kind of uh, uh, branch out from there. But really what we're focused on with these different batches that we're going to be running through this uh, production system is to, to really ask the question, you know, what's the cost benefit of buying in uh, pre-inoculated blocks versus growing oysters on straw versus growing mushrooms on supplemented sawdust? Uh, these are three of the main considerations, the main ways that folks get into mushroom cultivation. And so what we want to look at as well, some of these have um, less infrastructure required, but they might have more labor. Some might have more labor, but you might get a higher share of the profit. So we're going to compare these systems and really think about the potential within and, and also understand really what are the labor costs for each method? What, how do we estimate that? How do we quantify that and give some, someone a sense of what that looks like? Um, as we go along. The other questions we have is, you know, if we stick a shipping container out in the in a field, you know, what's it going to look like uh, in different times of the year? How much is it going to uh, cost to heat and cool that um, container, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of things to dig into. I'm really excited to, we're, we're in the build out process, the design process, but we're going to be learning a lot of different things. And we're going to be measuring all sorts of parameters, cost of construction and maintenance, are any labor inputs, um, what yields we get in terms of different substrates we inoculate, what the temperature, humidity, light, oxygen, carbon dioxide is, the moisture content of the materials we manage and, and how that might have an impact on our, on our production. And then again, as a whole, you know, how much energy are we using and what are the considerations at different times of the year? So we've got our work cut out for us, I'd say, as we go. And um, I would just end, end on this slide. Uh, you know, here's a summary. This is for log-grown shiitake. This came out of 10 years of research where we looked at and worked both on campus and then we worked with growers around the Northeast to basically get average costs. So now I can say to someone, well, it costs you about $5 in labor and materials to inoculate a log and you'll get X amount out of it. And this is how many times and this is how much labor it'll cost. Again, they're all estimates. They vary by grower, but gives us a sense. We can build a budget from that. And so our question with indoor production is, what's the cost? What's the production per cubic foot? Or what's the production per rack, as you can see in the, in the photo here? And hopefully we'll be able to provide that to you as we, as we go along. And uh, I'll just end this as an example. Uh, we are looking at the 50, the 40 foot shipping container size, but we're also building out smaller units where we can model production and have folks interact with these spaces on a rack by rack basis. So this is a unit we're gonna put in a project we're working at with some veterans in upstate New York, where we're gonna have them start to produce mushrooms, uh, hopefully on the order of 10 to 15 pounds a week with um, pre-inoculated blocks. So that's exciting and lots of fun to play with these systems. Uh, and hopefully as we go along, we'll be able to share, share what we learn and, and learn from you all as well as we go. Cool, so um, let's see here. I will stop sharing for a second. If there's any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. I'm gonna pause the recording for a second here as we transition. So, um, okay, I don't know if you stop sharing. Yep, I can see your screen. Okay, excellent, great. All right, um, hi everyone. My name is Yolanda Gonzalez. I am an urban agriculture specialist with Cornell Cooperative Extension. I am based in Brooklyn, New York. And as Steve mentioned, um, as part of this three-year research project, we are um, looking at education and building out a trainer, um, a train the trainer component. And so I'm just gonna talk to you today about this um, community mushroom uh, educator training that we have proposed. All right, so um, we are partnering with Just Food Farm School NYC and Grow NYC um, to offer a two-year community mushroom educator training that's um, hopefully looking to build a cohort of 60 service providers and education and educators from both urban and rural centers throughout the Northeast. Um, we specifically 
work wanted to work with these organizations because they do have an equity lens and we're looking to make sure that we incorporate that throughout the process so um, providing sliding scales making sure that we're reaching out to um, underrepresented um, communities and just trying to have a diverse cohort throughout the northeast and so as part of year two we're hoping to um, have a selection of 16 educators that are going to go on to receive ongoing support and mentoring um, as they implement education projects in their communities and just to make a note that this work is um, funded through both um, usda nefa and sarah so i just wanted to make that point and just to provide some program background um, this training is offered as a response to the growing demand for uh, mushroom education throughout the industry. In our communities, um, we, I primarily work with commercial urban growers and also gardeners that are selling $1,000 or more produce. And something that keeps coming up is an interest in mushrooms. And so there aren't that many um, service providers that are able to offer workshops. Usually it's a select handful of experts that will come down either from upstate or um, the same people giving the workshops in the city. And so this training really, um, the idea for this training came from wanting to expand educational capacity and kind of grow a cohort of educators throughout the Northeast that can um, respond to different requests for training and workshops. And this picture right here is actually of um, the recent Green Thumb uh, conference back in March. Uh, I co-presented with JJ, who is a mushroom educator here in the city. And we looked at a couple of ways to incorporate mushrooms into your community garden, specifically wine cap mushrooms and um, how to just work with different types of mushrooms, whether it be wine cap or oyster or shiitake, kind of understanding what resources you have available, which mushrooms make sense for your space. So as part of this train the trainer piece, um, uh, we're hoping to kind of hit on four major competency areas. So Mycology 101, looking at what are mushrooms, what are fungi, and their ID and life cycle, different forms of fungi, the history of cultivation. Um, we'll also be talking about different cultivation practices, indoor versus outdoor, startup infrastructure and costs, um, substrate materials and preparation, safe handling and storage, as well as um, pest and disease issues that may come up. Uh, we'll also be looking at production economics, um, like Steve mentioned, um, kind of starting a farm business, different factors in your farm development, different market channel assessments, enterprise planning and budgeting. And the last piece is this popular education. So uh, kind of understanding what that means, um, tapping into the collective knowledge of the group um, to talk about mushrooms and um, having a really interdisciplinary approach to learning. Uh, and as part of that approach, we're looking to um, have individual study, group discussion, live and, live and webinar workshop sessions, as well as individual support, one-on-one -on -one consulting, um, just different ways of, um, of learning. This is a proposed schedule and I just wanted to mention that all of this information will eventually make its way to the cornellmushrooms.org website. Um, for, but for now we're kind of doing an introduction and a basic overview of what the time frame will look like. So we're hoping to roll out applications for the training next year um, in, in the fall. Um, and then candidates would be selected and notified via email in early February pre-course work would start where we kind of um, just get a basic foundational understanding of uh, popular education so that we kind of know um, the methodology behind it. And then that summer we'll do in-person training. So right now we have um, New York City, Albany, and Baltimore as the three different locations for the in-person trainings. Um, and attend, uh, participants of the program don't necessarily need to go to all three, just one of the three. Um, so you can choose from any one that makes sense for you. Uh, whether you live upstate, then maybe it makes sense to go to the Albany one, or if uh, New York City is more accessible by train, then that can be an option. Um, we really want to spread these out as much as we can. And we'll be working with community partners in these three different locations to um, 
host the training as well. And then from that's year one, which is mostly focused on technical training. And then year two will be project based learning. Um, so really hands on work. So for folks that wanted to take their technical training to the next step and kind of get more experience with teaching. We're hoping to select 16 educators um, and really work with them closely to provide material support and um, this project based learning um, methodology in their community. And what is the cost uh, right now. We, we know that we still have to figure that out, but we are looking to keep costs low. Um, it will be tiered based on your organizational budget. So um, if, you, if you do come from an organization, you don't necessarily have to. Um, but if you are a service provider, let's say you work for a food related nonprofit, um, then it would be tiered based off of, you know, if you do come from an organization or if you don't. And then we'll have that breakdown of program costs on our website as well. And again, if funding is an issue, we'll work with you. If funding um, for travel is also an issue, we'll also work with you. So um, I'll provide my contact information at the end if you have any additional questions regarding costs. And just to kind of um, give an overview of what the process will look like. So I kind of talked a little bit about the time frame. Will be um, so participants will fill out a community mushroom educator application, um, and in this application, we're looking for participants that are really interested in delivering direct mushroom education to their communities, um, and who are available to complete pre work and can commit to it, participating to at least one of the two day trainings in the three locations that I mentioned before. So really if you, making sure that um, the commitment is there to follow through on all the um, different components of the training. And step two, uh, completing pre-course work, like I mentioned, understanding more about the popular education methodology um, through webinars, readings, and reflection. That way, um, when we do get into the in-person trainings, we can sort of hit the ground running and everybody's on the same page about um, this learning methodology. And like I mentioned, um, attending the in-person training, um, we'll be covering those four main um, areas. And at the end of the training, educators will receive a certificate indicating that they are a mushroom educator. And we're also looking to do a knowledge assessment to kind of understand what you learned pre-course and after the course um, to kind of get an, an understanding of um, what, what everybody's learned as a result of this train the trainers. And then um, in 2021, participants will receive ongoing support through mentoring, um, whether that be through email or phone check-ins and networking through the Mushroom Listserv, um, as well as completing two mushroom-related events in 2021. And I just wanted to emphasize that this year two is mostly focused again on project based learning. So this group of 16 individuals from both rural and urban centers um, mentoring this project team uh, as you design programming to meet your specific needs of the community. Um, and the group will meet online and in person to strengthen teaching and facilitation skills will also provide support for workshop materials and travel. So um, I think that last component is important because a lot of times you want to get started on a project, but you don't know where to go or don't have financial support in order to um, uh, source materials or substrate and all those things that go along with planning a workshop. And I wanted to emphasize that our main goal is really building a cohort of educators. Like I mentioned earlier on, um, not always going to the same quote unquote experts, mushroom experts, but building that educational capacity. So this cohort of educators throughout the Northeast is um, that cohesiveness of this group will really be a key feature of the Train the Trainers. And the 16 project-based learning individuals will also report back. So we'll have a chance to learn about their projects and their success in their communities um, by sharing their experience and how they've applied what they've learned. Um, and educators will 
hopefully be, the goal behind this is also for educators to be solicited for future mushroom workshop requests around the region. Um, so if a particular, particular um, community wants to learn more about mushrooms, they can tap into this cohort and, um, and essentially just make sure that we're all kind of sharing best practices around how to go about training and education. And here is my contact information if you have any um, questions. And um, I just wanted to make a plug for our Instagram page. That's where we post a lot of our uh, events and upcoming opportunities. So if you are in, on Instagram, that is our handle, urbanag.nyc. My email is yg88 at cornell.edu. And I'm just gonna take a moment now to look at the chat box. Okay.